This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day, wherever you're listening from, and welcome to Indoor Air Quality Radio, IAQ Radio. It's Friday, December 8th, 2017. This week, we're going to welcome Mark Springer and Phil Rosebrook, and uh, we've got Pete Consigli joining us as well. We're going to talk a little bit about the restoration industry's recent TPA event. Uh, third-party administrator is going to talk a little bit about that issue, kind of a hot topic within the restoration world. Uh, before we do, let's thank our marquee sponsors. IAQ Radio marquee sponsors are John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at IAQ.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Please be sure to thank our sponsors for their support of IAQ Radio when you inquire about their services or products. And last but not least, please visit the IAQ Training Institute website for the most current dates for the training you trust at iaqtraining.com and of course you can always email me at joe.hughes at iaq training if you want to get some continuing education credits for the show and let's turn it over to the z-man for today's iaq radio trivia question and now you can win a cool prize it's time for the iaq radio trivia question be the first to correctly answer simply email your answer to c zlotnick at cs.com or if listening live just text your answer from your computer and now here's the z-man with this week's iaq radio trivia question Hello, everybody, and congratulations go out to Vic Cafaro, Richmond, Virginia, for being first to identify Nikola Tesla as the inventor and scientist who, in 1896, was issued U.S. patent number 568177 for an ozone generator to limit or to work on ambient air. The IQ Radio Trivia question for today, Friday, December 8, 2017, has been sponsored by... ID is the solution chemistry company creating unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here is today's trivia question. Why is Mark David Chapman notorious? Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Cliff. Okay, we're going to talk with Mark Springer and Phil Rosebrook and, of course, Pete Consigli about the Restoration Industry Association's Strictly TPA, third-party administrator, fall conference review, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that conference and discussion with Mark. Mark is living the dream. He's the president of Day Spring Restoration, a company that specializes in disaster restoration. They've got six locations and about 100 team members. He's become a little bit of a celebrity in Montana because of his television advertising campaigns where he flooded and burned his house and then demonstrated to the community the restoration process. He's also big at giving back to his community and the industry. He's all, that's always been a priority for him. He serves on numerous nonprofit and trade association committees and boards, and he's currently a vice president at RIA. And we've also got Phil Rosebrook. Phil's a graduate of the University of Oregon Lundquist School of Business. Uh, he worked his way through college in the family restoration business, has a long history in the restoration world. Back in 1998, he joined his father as a partner in business mentors. He specializes in implementing change in restoration companies. He works with individual managers, key employees, and sometimes the field staff to implement new systems and procedures. He developed the operations manual and personnel manual that is utilized in all of the business mentors consulting pro programs, and he's a frequent presenter at industry conferences, contributing to the Water Loss, industry, Water Loss Institute course book. He's authored numerous articles in Cleaning and Restoration Magazine, also a founding partner in ELC Training, and he was a keynote at the RIA 
event recently. All right, let's see if we got everybody on the line. We have uh, Mark first. Let's say hello to Mark. Hey, Joe. Thanks again for having uh, us and covering this topic this week. Great to have you. And, Phil, I want to make sure I've got you on the line, too. I'm here. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this event. I appreciate it. Welcome. All right, let's, Mark, why don't you go ahead and set us up with a little background on the meeting. Uh, how, you know, what, what, what was the idea behind this fall conference that focused on the uh, TPA issue? Yeah, uh, Joe, so there was, uh, historically, RIA has hosted a fall event, and uh, going back, uh, I think, years into the past, there was actually more of a, a fall conference or, or technical summit, and typically those covered quite a broad range of topics, and uh, what we've seen, certainly over the last uh, few years, is that increasingly the restoration company owners and representatives have more and more competing for their attention. And so as uh, we looked at that, we really had a couple of things that drove our decision. Uh, one was we knew that we wanted to have a, an event that really focused on a specific issue that had a big impact on our members. And it kind of gets to some of our strategic goals. Uh, the, uh, the RA developed a new strategic plan back a few years ago, and one of those is that we want to be proactive about issues that affect the livelihood of our members. And we also want to cultivate relationships within the industry. And so as we looked at those strategic goals, we tried to identify uh, an issue that was really, really important to the members. And uh, actually, I somewhat, uh, giving credit where credit is due, have some credit to give to uh, Cliff, uh, to the Z-Man here, we had had a discussion earlier this year with the, within the Education Committee at RAA about what this event might be, and we had thrown out the topic of having something that focused specifically on TPAs because so many members at things like the annual convention talk about it. And after some initial kind of roundtable discussion, um, I wasn't sensing that there was enough uh, interest in, in that uh, topic and the TPA topic, so I would just about moved on. In fact, I think I might have even moved on. Cliff, you can correct me if I'm wrong if you remember the discussion. Uh, and then as we were moving forward, Cliff said, wait, 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 Mark, I don't, I don't think you gave enough consideration to this TPA conference. I think, I think that really is uh, uh, something that you guys need to consider. And so we had additional discussion and got enough uh, consensus on that that we decided to move forward on that topic. Uh, it was pretty interesting, Joe, as we started to unveil the topic to the industry, there was a tremendous amount of pushback. Uh, within the RIA, there's a pretty diverse membership. Some people do uh, even exclusively work for TPAs. And then some of our members do very little or no work for TPAs. So I knew it was going to be a little bit tricky uh, to be able to put this on. And I started getting phone calls from people who either thought it was absolutely insane that we would try to tackle this topic and thought we absolutely should not do it. Uh, and then I received uh, uh, calls from people who thought uh, if we did uh, something that uh, focused on this topic, it would look like an endorsement of TPAs, and they were kind of seeing things from the other end of the spectrum. So, so it was definitely a little bit of a juggling act at first, but my goal was just to present to our members information that would be helpful to them as they run their business. We weren't going to offer necessarily conclusions, but rather a lot of information to them to help them run their businesses. And so we ended up having uh, a little bit different format for this event. We had a lot of speakers. We had 23 speakers. The goal was to have kind of shorter TED-style talk presentations. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we accomplished a lot of dialogue. Uh, we had a lot of representatives from all the different spectrums, both contractors who do a lot of TPA work to ones that do very little. We had all the major TPA representatives uh, there uh, on a, uh, uh, a more of a town hall session. Hmm. And, and ultimately, at the end, the uh, event was very well reviewed, and, and people seemed to get a lot of benefit out of it. The, uh, the feedback has been uh, very positive. So, so that, that kind of gives you a kind of a, uh, I know a a mouthful there from 25,000 foot, um, but, but that's kind of the background on it, what actually ended up happening. 
All right. Well, thanks for that. Cliff, do you want to jump in here at all, or do you want me to go ahead and move on? No, no, no. You know, he just asked me about the conversation. What had happened was we were going around, Mark, and, and speaking to the subject, and I had my hand up or whatever, and you were just going to break discussion without letting me comment. So that's, that's, that's what I remember. But uh, we're good. Uh, All right. Let's move on, Jeff. Let's get Phil in here. Phil, you were, you know, you were asked to do the keynote, um, and I was, was hoping you could give us the, uh, the Cliff Notes version of your keynote presentation and so that listeners who weren't there and even those who were, and I see we have a couple that were at the event actually listening in today, um, maybe get a little review for them and uh, maybe a different, uh, different perspective as you talk about it here today. Sure. Okay, so one of the, uh, one of the things I wanted to, to state before, and is Mark, Mark called me in, uh, in, I think it was in May, and asked if I would, uh, if I would start off uh, the session. And he, I, in our conversation, I think he had uh, stated that uh, he thought I was a, a, a good choice to start this, because I had a different perspective from a lot. Uh, we spent 10 years in the industry. We, uh, we started out as restorers. My, my father bought a restoration company in, in 1988, and I was just getting out of high school. So I spent my formative business years working in restoration, cleaning walls and uh, extracting water and uh, kind of working through all the positions you could fill in a restoration company. So we spent 10 years um, um, in the trenches uh, kind of as this whole thing was going on. I, you know, I, I, I think about the restoration world at the time, and it was, uh, it was people. People might think that restoration is relatively new. It had been around since maybe the '60s. Cliff could answer better to that, but maybe late '50s, early '60s is what they taught me in my certified restorer class. Uh, but but it was still kind of a, an old-fashioned business back in the '70s, and so um, up and through the '80s is when we started seeing a lot of change. So I had been in the contracting world, and then the last 20 years, I've been I've been working with restoration companies as an advisor to their business. And so I, I saw both sides of it, and, uh, and Mark felt that I was a, a great candidate for that uh, opening session because I could frame the issue well. So um, given that, my, my session, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to do is, is uh, state that um, I, I don't really have a dog in the fight, and I, I, do have a, I do have a perspective, and that perspective is I want to create successful companies. And I can, I've, I've worked with successful companies that were in TPAs and, and working effectively in, in that environment, and I work with companies that have nothing to do with TPAs, and they're very effective in that environment. And so so my, my point of view is let's create successful businesses, and it doesn't matter um, whether you're in or out. The, the, I think the choice is to be a uh, to be proactive in your business and your business strategy and own that and then be successful within that, in that environment and too often people will jump into um, this uh, maybe it's a vertical of TPAs and, and then they go all in and they lose control of their business because that's all they have at that point and so one of the things I, I wanted to talk or, or at least um, reflect in this discussion is that you don't have to you don't have to be uh, on one side or the other to create a successful business, but you do have to have a deliberate strategy that says um, I know what I'm doing, and I sit down and I look at it on an annual basis, and I'm clear with what my strategy is, and that uh, I'm not just going down a road because it seemed like it made sense at the time, and then not reflect or, or look at that and, and see the impact on the business. So that's where I that's where I come from in in uh, kind of the perspective on this presentation. And uh, before I do that, I kind of want to set the stage for um, the, this life cycle of TPAs and and to talk about why they came about. And, and uh, before we do that, I want to I, I want to talk about what the restoration world was like when I first got into it in 1988. The, the first thing is it was very fractionalized. It, it was a whole bunch of independent, independent players in each market doing their own thing. Um, and and it, was, uh, it was about relationships. Uh, there was very inconsistent pricing. You didn't, you didn't, uh, we got our first copy of, of Xactimate in probably 1992. And before that, your job was to go out, look at a job, figure out how much uh, materials, labor required to get the job done, and then put an appropriate price to it. 
And so it was kind of old fashioned. You actually had to know something about construction and, and, uh, and estimating and restoration, not just how to work a keyboard. And so one of the things you found is that from job to job, market to market, the prices would change radically. And it was always about um, a, a friend of mine. Uh, many of you guys know Reed Dow. Reed Dow used to uh, uh, used to talk with us, and, and he was an expert at what he called wordsmithing. And uh, in in there is just about you know it, the, the right word will get you an extra ten thousand dollars on a job. <laughs> and so you know that wasn't good or bad. It was just about what what story you could tell and how that added value. And I think that often we don't, uh, we don't look and say, what is the value proposition of what I'm doing? And back in the old days, you had to do that. But at the same time, it did create opportunistic pricing. It created inconsistencies in service delivery and pricing. And uh, it was really about, it was about re- the relationships that you had. And in some ways, I, I saw that all business was local. There wasn't a way to get away from that. It was, it was um, you know, Cliff Zalotnik, um, uh, I'm assuming he coined it because I, I heard it first in, in an IICRC class. It was the fire smoke class. And uh, they talked about marketing. They talked about, uh, about marketing by donating around. So going out and taking, uh, taking a box of donuts to an adjuster's office. <laughs> and that was what the business was about. It was kind of simpler in, in, in a lot of ways. And then some, some fundamental things started happening in the business environment that were going to transform, and they laid the groundwork for this TPA world. And without these fundamental changes, it couldn't have existed. And the, the first one was the pricing, the pricing books. And you know, the old days, it was Blue Book, uh, but that was just a book you had on your desk, and it was updated every year. And then Xactimate came out, and they started doing uh, sort of standardized pricing. And one of the things that we liked about it is we learned relatively early on that it removed the entire price discussion from estimating. We, we would go, and we would talk with an adjuster about scope. And if the scope was the same, then our prices were the same. And it made, it, it made a big difference. And so scope became the issue, not price. Uh, the same, at the same time, I think we're also looking at um, some advances in technology that had to take place in order for the TPA world to be relevant. And, you know, the first one, I, I think of the, uh, the old uh, dial-up modems, but we were able to communicate electronically or digitally for the first time where we didn't actually have to pick up a phone and we had kind of archaic emails and everything was slow and cumbersome. But it was the groundwork that allowed us to have communication across space and time um, that, uh, that allowed us to eventually upload and download estimates and communicate that way. But, but you had to have this advantages in technology. Uh, one of, one of the things, it was, it was a bit transformational to me, too. I, I was at a uh, major insurance company's office, and, and we had spent a lot of time in our business investing in technology and investing in training, especially on the water side. I remember one time we brought, um, we brought dry ease down to our office, and we trained every employee in our company, which, incidentally, was the, most, um, the, the best marketing that we could do because the day they came down, we ended up with a big commercial drying job that we had to do, <laughs> so half the class left. But at the same time, we really um, spent a lot of time looking into drying and saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to be um, on the forefront of technology. And so here we go out and we learn and we know what we're doing. And this major insurance company says, we have this new program that's going to be perfect for you. It's going to be a drying-only program. And this was one of the first ones that we had seen. We thought, wow, this is fantastic. And I, I became pretty good friends with the claims manager. And she still had not been giving us any claims at all because we weren't, um, we, we weren't a qualified or approved. It was approved, not qualified. It was the approved contractor. But she said, this will probably, this will probably be something great for you. And so um, she calls me up one day and she says, Phil, I got some bad news. She said, uh, we've chosen um, a franchise uh, group to, to service our drying needs, and it's out of my hands. I can't do anything about it. The decision was not made here locally. And so I, I only took solace because I, I realized that, you know, we're pretty good at what we do, and I knew that, I knew that franchise, that particular franchise was not very good. Mm-hmm. And so I just assumed it would be a matter of time, and we'd come back and swoop up that work. Well, it turns out that uh, we sold the business in 1997, which was probably about six or seven years later. They were still on the program, and we weren't. So one of the things you started seeing is that they, insurance companies wanted a bigger decision, not a local market decision, and they didn't particularly want the best contractors. They wanted to have a predictable solution. And then you ended up with other changes. So, and, you know, I think one of them that was very interesting was um, um, Berkshire Hathaway, founded by um, Warren Buffett. 
um, bought Geico Insurance. And one of the things, and this is kind of subtle, but I think that it really became a big deal, is he realized, he was one of the first people in the insurance world that realized, I can make money on claims. If I make money on claims, not only do I get free money to invest, but actually somebody pays me to invest their money. And so once he took and said, Here's, this is where we're going to make money on, claim, on, on insurance because we can make money on claims, now insurance companies, it laid the groundwork for insurance companies to, you know, traditionally they would lose money on premiums. They would take in premiums and they pay out claims and they would typically pay out, <clears throat> excuse me, somewhere between 98 and a dollar two, 98 cents and a dollar two or dollar three on claims, and that was okay. But now the groundwork was laid for we need to make money on our premiums and on our uh, on our investing. So, so these, all these things were um, you know as we started now getting more advances in in mobile technology and uh, things like that. So all this stuff was laying the groundwork for what would currently be taking place in the industry. But it couldn't happen in 1984 because you had to have these things laid first. Hmm. And then, uh, so we get into some of the things that are going with contractors. We're here we're th- sitting and thinking, we, uh, as a group, we have some faulty assumptions, and we need to address these. Um, the, the first one, and this is, what I, this is where I got uh, kind of misdirected on that, uh, that drying um, program that the insurance company put together, that competence was not the top influence to contractor selection. So the insurance companies wanted to make sure that the clients were well-served, uh, but it didn't have to be the best because the clients, how they performed their perception of, uh, of the work that we did was based on the relationship with the person doing the work and not the work itself. It's sort of like when I go get my car fixed, I really feel naive because I don't know whether they're taking advantage of me or not. But if I really like the guy behind the desk, I'm going to pay the bill and I'm going to come back and bring my car back. And the insurance companies realized this uh, long before maybe the, the competent contractors did. So you assume he was uh, doing a good job because he was well, a nice guy. Yes, absolutely. And I still think that, and, and I hate it because I just got an estimate for uh, new shocks on my car. I'll, I'll take a call later about that and figure out whether he's going to take advantage of me. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of the other things on the other side of it is, as a company that did the right thing, we assume that value is driving the behavior of the restoration contractors, that everybody was doing things in the same way, and that, you know, it was about being fair and making sure that we, that we gave a good product and drove value in the end. But the, the truth is there's a lot of scoundrels out there. There's a lot of companies that are about making profits, and they're making profits at the expense of doing the right thing or taking care of the client or taking care of the insurance company or whatever it is. And so you have to take a look and say, okay, there, there is an element of our industry that is causing a lot of problems, and, and you had to understand that. And so insurance companies now want consistency, and they want value, and, and all these things that, uh, that we assume was happening that maybe weren't. So um, another thing we lay into this, another layer that we lay into it is we've got to look at the insurance world. The insurance world understands these vendor programs. HMOs have been around since 19 uh, – I did a little research on it – since the late 1930s. They, they had uh, started trying to create this HMO buying or vendor group uh, within the healthcare. And then auto glass, auto repair, I couldn't figure out exactly when that started, but it was in the 80s for sure. They had started programs in auto glass and auto repair. And these are other arms of the insurance industry. They're familiar in working with managed claim and managed repair programs. And so we have to understand the insurance companies are looking for big solutions, not claim by claim. And they don't really care what happens in San Antonio, Texas, or Seattle, Washington. They just look at numbers on a graph. They also, they're, looking, they're sitting in a boardroom and they're looking at numbers on a graph and a chart. That makes a difference to them because they can now make big decisions based on uh, different uh, elements in that. And they want things that are predictable. I mean, you know, it, it's a little better, it's a little more predictable when you have a, a more standardized way of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. So that gives us kind of the historical perspective. And then currently, there's some big issues going on that uh, that we need to be aware of. And I think it's going to drive this whole managed claims um, uh, solution uh, to the next level. And, and why I don't, you know, people always figured restoration was a pendulum. And I heard this uh, so many times. You know, it used to be this way, then it went back, and it used to be this way, and it went back. And it's always going to come back. And so I'm not going to make changes because, you know, it's going to come back to me and I'm going to be all right. And in reality, if we look at the business world today and we look at um, InsurTech, 
which is basically all the technology in the insurance world, it is dramatically and radically and rapidly changing their industry. And so if we don't understand that, then we can't be in a position where we can, where we can meet the needs of that industry. And so, you know, some of the things, I mean, if you guys have heard of Lemonade Insurance, I, I find it fascinating. Lemonade Insurance is basically a virtual insurance company that you can buy, you know, and they, they typically are working in, um, in homeowners or renters, I'm sorry, renters insurance and maybe a little bit of auto, things that don't require as much um, as sophistication in the claim settlement. But it is a virtual insurance company that uh, it, if you have time, go look at it and see what they're doing because, you know, at some point something like that is going to exist in property restoration. They're, they're reaching out into the property uh, in, um, uh, P&C insurance market. I, I just don't know how they're going to handle claims. I think that maybe going through a TPA might be the best. Uh, one of the things that um, a friend of mine had a water damage in her house, and she asked me to come over and take a look at it because she was taking care of it herself, and she just wanted she couldn't figure out why she uh, couldn't get the smell out. I went into her basement. She rented a uh, LGR de- uh, dry use dehumidifier from Home Depot. And, um, you know, if I go to the Home Depot website and I look at their, their equipment rental page, it's full of our restoration equipment. One of the things that I also see, I, I spent some time here recently working with, um, with a major plumbing franchise, and one of the things that they realized is that um, if enough restoration companies come and knock on their door saying, I want to pay you a lot of money for your restoration leads, there might be some money in the industry. And so they've started um, branching out into restoration. Sure. And my, my opinion is I think they're going to be one of the largest drying companies in the next 10 years in the country. Just the because they company. get first notice of loss, if they're sophisticated, and know what they're doing, then then it's going to put up some real barriers to entry. Well, I, I think a similar thing happened back in when 2007, 2008, when the housing industry collapsed. I think a lot of contractors, you know, general contractors and home builders, got into the restoration industry. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Well, um, you know, one of the things that. Uh, you know, I guess we look and say, you know, I'm going to go somewhere where the insurance companies aren't. I'm going to go to residential or, or commercial property management companies. I'm going to go to HOAs. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to commercial direct. And one of the, and one of the things I've heard over the years is that's where the TPAs are going too. So we're chasing this this market that keeps diminishing. Saying I'm not going to go with the TPAs. I'm going to go somewhere else. Uh, however, the TPAs see that too, and they want that market. And so if if we're chasing after that, it keeps getting smaller and smaller, and maybe if there's more and more restoration companies going there, it's a hard place to be. The, um, I, I think about Uber, and I think how Uber has impacted um, the, uh, the business world, and, and people are talking about the Uberization of a market. Um, I think that, um, that I guess if I look at what, um, what Crawford here has done recently, they bought a company called We Go Look. And I looked into that a little bit, and it's, I don't know if, if they know what they want to do with it yet, but we go look, it uh, basically puts an adjuster within proximity of the damage. And so they want to go for verification. If somebody calls and says, I think I have a problem, I have smoke, I have water, whatever, they have a, a, basically a spatial location, and they'll say, let's get somebody out there quickly. It looks like we have somebody that's uh, two miles away. I can have them there in 20 minutes. Hmm. So they show up, and they just verify loss. Um, so I think, you know, things like this are radically changing our business. It's about speed. It's about, um, about consistency. So if we get this person who shows up the first time and they verify loss and they take photos and, and then that goes to help follow this process all the way through to conclusion of the claim, that now all of a sudden that they, they've created some synergies there and they've sped the process up, which is going to save them money and hopefully make their clients happier. So all of this stuff is going on in the industry right now. We need to be aware of it because that is going to start pushing towards the TPA environment. Um, you know, and a couple of things, I'll, I'll build in a couple of uh, expectations that I see coming out of this is that um, I don't think claims are going to turn to a local market decision anytime soon. I think that uh, we're going to try to use insurance companies are looking and saying, how do I use technology in order to be present on a job site immediately and, uh, and then be able to, um, to maintain that relationship without having to send somebody out there, which is really going to slow down the process. And cost some money. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think that the catastrophe um, realities, which we see in California through this, the, the uh, fires right now, are we in Texas and 
in uh, Miami this year. I think that, that that's impactful, and it'll be impactful in our industry. And I think that the insurance companies, you know, one of the things I believe that uh, the TPAs will offer a solution for is they're going to be able to provide more response and better response in, in a catastrophe situation. I, I had a client that, uh, that really owns a, a large market that was impacted. They're, they're a dominant player there, and they realized during the middle of the storms that they were very, very vulnerable because their clients wanted them to, over, to, to serve all their needs, and they couldn't do it. And, I, and so that kind of made me think, gosh, you know what, a TPA, maybe they've got just the same local resources that everyone else does, but I know contractors that will come from out of town because the TPA calls them in and they know they have work. So they aren't going to typically chase storms, but now, hey, I can go down to Miami or Houston, and my work is guaranteed, and I know I'm going to get paid. Yeah. And so that changes, expands, the, expands their capacity and capabilities quite substantially. And, uh, and I think that that's something that uh, becomes really relevant to an insurance company, property manager, or anybody else who experienced that real large volume of work. So given that, I just think the contractors need to be deliberate. The insurance companies are going to be deliberate. They're looking for that solution which streamlines the process, that shortens the cycle time and closes files quickly because it helps their business practice and it also helps them um, push to renewals and referrals, which is what they want from their business. Hey, you know, I had a loss and they were here in 10 minutes. They were here in an hour, whatever it was, and they made me whole and I appreciated that. So, you know, we help fulfill their moments of truth and um, and response speed and uh, synergy is is really what they're looking for at this point. Okay. So in some ways, you know, I think at, at this point I went into some TPA's advantages and disadvantages, and I don't really want to go heavily into that. Um, it just, you know, we understand they're good and bad. Uh, but, you know, I get to, to, to the summary of my presentation, which is be deliberate and strategic. Know what you're doing, have a plan, and move for that plan, move through that plan. And then, you know, what, I also have this thought that, you know, we, we spend a lot of time forming opinions because we hear something. I think TPAs are bad because this contractor had a bad experience. I always figure, you know, if you, if you want to see what this market's like, go in and experience it. Do 10 jobs. And if it doesn't work for you, don't do 11. Do 10 jobs and say, you know, it's not my cup of tea. I'm moving on. Um, and, and I think one of the other things is I wouldn't let anybody be too uh, – too responsible for, for the work of my business. So I'm going to try to maintain or manage where all of my work sources give me less than 20% of my total volume. Yeah. And so if one work source is worth 25, let's cut it down. Let's not make them go away. Let's grow something else to reduce the, um, the um, uh, dependence I have on that one company. Uh, if I can do that, then I can, I can lose anybody and still control my business. So if they make uh, demands and, and want me to do something I don't want to do, I can say no. So, right. um, and, and finally, one of the things that Steve Tobiran taught me, um, customer focus is a winning strategy. If you make sure that you take care of the customer, everything else takes care of itself. So if you don't serve the customer, that you, your business is not going to succeed. And if you do, you have all sorts of options. So make sure that you have a nimble business that also is very responsive to your customers and make sure that you have a cheerleader customer at the end of the project. And then I think a lot of other things are going to resolve themselves in this process. So right. um, I took more than the 10 minutes that I, that I well, said that I was going to, but I think it was a good summary of where we were and, and uh, kind of what brought this about. I agree, Phil. And what we're going to do, we're going to break for halftime, and then when we come back, we're going to start to throw out some questions and, and get into a little more detail on the topic. So we'll be right back with our guests, Mark Springer, Phil Rosebrook, and Pete Consigli. IAQ Radio would like to thank our association sponsors. The Indoor Air Quality Association, a nonprofit multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Visit them at iaqa.org. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them, wolfsense.com. IAQ marquee sponsors are... John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. 
Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at IAQ.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Okay, we're back for the second half of our interview. We've got Mark Springer, Phil Rosebrook, and we will have Pete Consigli on in just a moment. But, uh, Cliff, let me turn it over to you, and maybe you could put out a couple of these toss-up questions that we had. Thanks, Joe. Um, I guess I guess what the first question is, from the contractor side, what are the biggest complaints about TPA? <laughs> Phil, do you want to uh, take a uh, I'll take there? a couple of those. Yeah, um, there was a survey, but I'll just tell you um, some of the some of the things I hear. I think that um, you end up um, with a third party that doesn't is not an expert on claims that at the local level is making um, is making um, decisions on what's going to be done and what's not going to be done on a claim, and it's not always necessarily tied to the damage on the property. And so it's, uh, you know, these are our rules and it uh, doesn't matter. You know, we're going to do a uh, certain, uh, certain number of days that we'll pay for on drying. And if you don't, if you don't comply with that, then it doesn't matter. Uh, these are our rules. And so you get, you get somebody who's looking at um, kind of the big picture, uh, the metrics, the numbers, and making claims decisions that aren't relevant to the actual damage to the property. Happens more often than, uh, than it should. Yeah, and I think so. Some of the things I'd, I'd uh, add in, we actually asked our members what the biggest challenges they faced were, and we, we presented a survey and had, you know, a lot of times we send these surveys out from RIA, and, you know, you get a very small response uh, to the surveys because people are busy, they get a lot of email. Uh, but we had a lot of response on this question. And uh, really the big ones that folks got back to us on is they said, man, it's just getting tougher and tougher to make acceptable margins in this industry. We feel that our margins are, are really under pressure. And between the uh, program restraints uh, or the uh, requirements within the programs and then the cost of the programs and the admin that's required for the programs, Really, it's, it's getting more and more difficult to make a reasonable profit margin. Uh, the second thing that really was uh, a big concern was uh, compliance with the requirements, particularly what a lot of people pointed out were that the, the, a lot of the programs have more or less unwritten rules that are enforced by uh, adjusters or by compliance representatives from people who usually are, are quite a ways away from wherever the loss is happening and don't have any experience. And uh, in, in dealing with those things, they really just find it difficult to have someone more or less overseeing their job without really any technical experience. So that, that really was a big, uh, a big complaint uh, from folks with them. And then the other, another one that was kind of at the top of the list was the variation of the guidelines. So we have all these different carriers that have different requirements for their programs. And then uh, within all these different, different carriers, they have different kind of hot points and hot buttons. And that results in the contractor constantly trying to uh, adjust <clears throat> to meet these requirements. So those were kind of the big ones that we uh, got back. And then what we did is we took those concerns and we posed those directly to the TPA representatives and asked them to address them. And, and we were really hopeful that they would address those issues and explain to us how those uh, problems or challenges evolved and how they became uh, big for the contractors and then some suggestions as how they might be dealt with. Uh, unfortunately, that really didn't get tackled quite in the way we were hoping it would, but uh, that was certainly what we heard back from our members. Let me go to a, I've got a couple text questions here. One kind of falls in line with what we wanted to ask anyway, So, and, and the, the question being, what's the, the value proposition from the TPA to the contractors? So um, what do the contractors, you know, I know they're, some are upset about the whole idea of TPAs, but what, what's a positive side for the contractor? I'll give, I'll give you two. Uh, the first one is the one that they sell all the time. You 
don't, once you get on a program, you don't have to spend any time out marketing. Matter of fact, they don't want you to go market to a claims office. So it's consistency and work. And um, you know, Paul Gross used to always say, your equipment on the shelf doesn't make any money. So if you're able to uh, to recoup some money, even though it's not what you wanted, which is his justification for uh, Code Blue paying a little less, was um, you get your equipment off the shelf and out working for you. So they've, you know, you're able to market and and um, leverage your marketing resources, and that's that's the big takeaway that they want. The I, I think the um, the second one, and this this is something I learned this last year, and um, I'm writing a white paper based on my or not a white paper. It's going to be a two part article on cleaning and restoration coming out in the I think January February up at, uh, editions about my keynote. Uh, but one of them was uh, down in South Florida. There's there's a uh, the, it's a very um, um, let's say challenging claims environment and insurance companies don't seem to be making uh, logical um, or fair decisions that uh, that that um, properly restore the property, take care of the client and take care of the uh, restoration contractor. They they're making arbitrary decisions, they're paying fractions of what they should be paying, sometimes 20-30% of the total claims cost. And then telling people, you know what, you guys figure it out. Hmm. And so, one of these companies has um, signed on with uh, with one of the TPAs. And to me, I find it really interesting because the TPA should be able to establish the rules of the game and then re- and then enforce those rules. And so, it takes away some of the arbitrary nature that you see being uh, set up within these claims programs at the insurance level. So I'm hoping, I'm very hopeful. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm hoping that it that it establishes strong ground rules to the claims management so at least you know what you're getting into and it takes away a lot of the uh, inconsistencies in pricing and scope and and determining the value of the program or the uh, the job itself so from that standpoint it's known rules to the game and then secondarily the volume of work that they hope that, that you hope to get from them let's look at another one I'm, now the the question is how does the TPA contract um, or, or I guess, do they conflict with federal consumer protection laws? Or um, so you know. Another question I've heard similar in the past is that even like Xactimate was kind of a, a monopoly on things that you know you, that you weren't supposed to be. It was like price fixing. How does that look that on a on a bigger picture? <laughs> Where's our attorney? <laughs> <laughs> No attorney to answer that. Uh, I, I think it, uh, the the issue there is it, it certainly could uh, interfere with consumer protection laws. Uh, I'm not aware of. I mean, we've looked at uh, that uh, issue as far as the the contract with the TPA, and we haven't been able to, at least in our state, be able to determine that it does uh, put the consumer in in a bad position. But I think there are some where it could, and I think a lot of the things that basically become the unwritten rules of the programs uh, certainly could be uh, could increase risk in that area okay I, I think this may be an attorney texting me here anyway these contractors have to let consumers know the limits that they have to work with in the TPA space if not it leaves the contractor open to lawsuits that that makes sense if you you know, you're working within certain restrictions that the TPA is putting on you. Should you notify? Do you guys recommend they notify their customers? I think. I mean, I think that's reasonable. I think to to um, to, to establish the rules of the game, or just to talk about the relationships, I think it's important. Um, I think where the real challenge gets into is if they're asking you to do things that are are not in the best interest of the property or the property owner. And that was one thing that uh, we talked about what Marty King said. Marty King used to always say you have to restore the property to its pre-loss condition. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what the rules are from some insurance company or some vendor program, what, what speaks to the restoration of the property. And so it, if, certainly if that's compromising the end result, that, hey, the rules are different because we're in this vendor program and your property isn't going to be restored property properly, then we should that should be a requirement to say, you know what, we're working through this insurance program and they're telling us that we um, that that we need to do something outside of what our our typical standards would be. And I think that's reasonable. Okay, all right, Cliff, let me do, let you jump in here. Okay, um, you know, as an older person. Um, 
as many of the contractors are in the business, particularly the older ones, the, the successful ones, how do they handle oversight from millennials who are located a thousand miles away? Just to clarify that, Cliff, do you mean the uh, desk, either the desk adjusters or the compliance representatives from the TPA? I want to make sure that, that that's both. what we're talking about. Yeah, both. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a real challenge. I mean, there was uh, kind of when Phil referenced the what would Marty do, uh, we had a, a speaker there, uh, Rusty Amarante from Belfour, who addressed this kind of this whole issue of where should the, the restorer's allegiances lie and, and is there a potential ethical challenge with some of these agreements and some of the things that happen with respect to the execution of the work on these jobs. So uh, I, there was a comment made in that that I think really resonated with a lot of the audience there, and that is that you know a 22-year-old uh, person sitting at a desk 500 miles away can't speak to the technical issues uh, that are required in the field. I mean, I think one of the things that Phil hit on, and I, I think a lot of people hit on, I mean, there's no question that technology is going to have an impact on this business, and there's no question that uh, a lot of things are changing. Sometimes I think that a lot of these predictions get a bit fantastical and a bit overblown, because at the end of the day, we have a very dynamic industry. I mean, the, the, the properties that we work in are all different. Uh, the types of perils that we deal with are numerous. The types of customers that we deal with are uh, very different on a, and on a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, simply uh, uh, trying to apply a boilerplate solution to a very uh, difficult business where there's a lot of judgment required is is a real problem for a lot of restorers. Now, how that's addressed and how that's fixed, I think, requires a lot of, you know, leadership and collaboration. Um, but but it's something that I, I don't know that there's necessarily an, a an answer. I think oh, the, the question you ask, Cliff, is almost r rhetorical, but, um, it, but it's a real problem that I think a lot of people are frustrated by. And I think that the TPA reps who were there at the event in Nashville heard that loud and clear. And I think that we're going to have to figure out ways that we can collaborate and that we can communicate the mutual interest we all have, which is, from the carrier's perspective, they need to keep clients. And the restorer has to have satisfied clients, and that can't happen if the work isn't allowed to be executed in a way that uh, puts their best interest at the forefront. I guess it's a follow-up to both you and Phil. I, I have an opinion on this, but I'm not going to express it. I, I want to ask you, do, do either or both of you feel that TPAs work better on water claims than on fire claims? Well, as a contractor who deals... Now, I will in full disclosure say this. Uh, my company fits in the category of small TPA work. Uh, we do less than 3% of our revenues in uh, in the TPA world. So we only do a couple hundred TPA jobs per year. Um, I can say that fire claims are a rarity in in TPA assignments. Uh, they're, they're very few and far between. Uh, and so by far, uh, water damage assignments are, are the most frequent. What I find interesting is one specific TPA that we worked with told us that any water losses that exceed $2,500 in cost are immediately flagged as being a, a, a questionable claim. So anytime they receive a, a scope of work or an invoice in excess of $2,500, their system is kicking that out and saying, we've got a problem or a potential anomaly here. We find that interesting because we know that the average water loss in our company is a little bit north of $3,200. So more or less every single water damage claim that we have on average is going to be considered an anomaly. Now my question is, how did they ever get to the point that that was the data, that that $2,500 is the data point for them? And I mean, just as a personal aside from you know, more or less anecdotal evidence here, I think it's because a lot of people don't have the right work being conducted in their properties uh, to have it at that level. But that that's kind of a separate issue. Cliff, do you want to go to you the roundup? What about the fireside? Go ahead. 
Yeah, I, I think that uh, the TPAs, the, their, their core competency is managing process, managing process on so that, that high frequency, low dollar claim. That's what they're, that's what they're particularly good at. And that's, so that's the, that's the um, 80% of the, the, or the, the, um, the eighty percent of the volume is these smaller claims. It's not the big ones, and so so they're taking a look and saying, how can we cut off administrative costs? How can we minimize those claims from from our our um, management capacity? So how do we limit that? And um, and so that's what the core conference is. They look and say, okay, we're going to manage dates. We've got a formula from S five hundred. We've got some some things that are really easy to put in this package, and we can look at those dates and numbers and manage that process. And and that's what TPAs do. They they manage process. They manage numbers. They manage dates and times. And that's what they're particularly attuned to. And I don't think they're uh, when you get into more complex projects where you have contents, you've got a little bit of water, you've got structure, you've got people with um, in their uh, out of their houses, they got ALE and all sorts of other things going on. Uh, that that changes the complexity of the claim, and there's much less um, um, let's say synergies on the larger losses. So. Um, I, I don't see that as being, at this point, their core competency, and I don't see it as the area where they're primarily working. I, as a matter of fact, I think it's a rarity when you have a $40,000 claim being managed by a TPA. Cliff, now, you go that to... being said, I've been in the industry for 20 years, so uh, maybe, I'll, uh, maybe I'm wrong on that. Um, in speaking to the TPAs, and I spoke to the managers in a number of these, and I'm doing my preparation for this, that that person making those arbitrary decisions is not the way the program was set up and they have put in what they call escalations and so you can go up the chain because in the boardroom at the top that's not what they desire now that's what happens but that's not what they desire so you know if you go around somebody and say I'm gonna go talk to your boss about this because you're wrong now that creates a whole lot of other problems but that's not the way the programs were set up at least what they convey in their messaging is they want to make sure that the client's taken care of and the property is taken care of and it returned to a healthy state in the end. So there is escalations. That's the local claims manager or claims office that's a 20-year-old desk adjuster that's criticizing the experienced technician in the field. So that being said, um, I'll, I'll give it back to Cliff. All right. Let's go to Roundup. Move him on, hit him up, hit him up. Move him on, move him on, hit him up, raw high. All right, let's get one more question out. Before we do, I want to bring in uh, Pete Consigli, the Restoration Industries Global Watchdog. Pete, any comments from the first part of the show? Well, no, not really. I mean, I think uh, Mark and uh, Phil did a really good job of giving the, the history, the background of the event, how it evolved, uh, you know, and how it was delivered. I mean, there was so much packed into those two days that... Um, you know, you can only cover so much in a one hour podcast. But yeah. uh I I don't I no, I don't really have any comment on any of the, the, you know, the kind of the questions I like this come back back and forth. Getting some great text feedback here too, and I see the same issue. It's tough to in one hour try and really uh, put any finality on this thing, and uh, I, I'm getting the, uh, some great text comments in about the limits. Yes, the limits of the TPA have to be explained up front. If not, it will leave the restoration contractor open to suits. Interesting comment. I think that's from an attorney, too. Um, and he also says he doesn't see the two sides, he or she doesn't see the two sides coming together. The wedge has been there, and it is growing. I'm curious. Uh, Mark and or Phil, I want to throw this out to either one of you. What what do the TPA representatives think a after the conference? What did they have to say? What did they take out of it? So I think that the wedge is definitely there, um, and it, it has gotten deeper as some of these uh, programs have continued to evolve. I do believe that what happened and the communication that uh, was initiated in Nashville is a good first step. Now, I think one of the things that was frustrating about the event is that we wanted the TPA representatives to tackle some of these real substantive, difficult questions that are real 
in the lives of the contractors. And, and I think there's an opportunity to continue that dialogue with that because they, they all acknowledge this without a good contractor network, you know, and, and maybe sometimes we use the wrong term. I mean, these, these companies aren't really as much third party administrators as they are contractor networks without quality contractors who are able to provide a great product. They don't have an offering. And, and while, restorers can get pushed and pushed and pushed, at some point they hit that tipping point and they say, I can't do this anymore because I can't offer the right service and I can't make a reasonable profit margin. I mean, there is some point where you get there. Uh, I think that if, and perhaps even this, this show is a good venue for that, we need to continue to address the questions that were asked by the contractors that are meaningful. And there was, we actually had a live polling app during the event that had several hundred questions pour in during the, the town hall session. And we only hit the very, very tip of that iceberg. And I mean, I, I'd be so bold as to put this out to you guys. I think it would be really interesting to get some of these reps on your show and ask all the questions that really the contractors wanted to get asked. And maybe this is a place that that could happen. I'll just throw that out there. Love to do it. Well, if you give us some names, uh, we'll try to do that. Yep. No, I think it would be it. really interesting for the contractors. Yeah. All right. Pete, or, or Cliff, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't, Go ahead. I didn't speak to any of them after the event, uh, but, but one of the things that I know beforehand, um, there was a conversation that went to one of them that's, that said, in your, in, in your network, are you finding holes in your marketplace? Are you finding places where it's tough to get new contractors? And then secondarily, the follow-up question is, are your best contractors taking on more zip codes or are they removing zip codes? And the answer to both those questions were, yes, it's difficult, and yes, our best contractors are removing zip codes, and, uh, and that is problematic for them. Hmm. So, so there's awareness that there are challenges in, in these relationships. Let me throw out what I, what I feel like is an 800-pound gorilla in this whole conversation, and that's the franchises. I mean, doesn't this model work well with the franchises? And do you guys see that as a, uh, maybe somehow part of the intent was to you know, have a more standardized product? Well, that's what a franchise is. Have a standardized pricing you know, nationwide. Have, have nationwide coverage. It seems like it fits well with the franchises and maybe not so well with others. And, or am I way off base? I'm not from this industry. Well, that's where it started was with the franchises. And what they found was they didn't get consistent service delivery from market to market. They maybe got the same metrics, the same numbers in the same way, but they, didn't, they couldn't control service quality and they would like they thought they could. And so I talked to somebody who had uh, been the founder of one of these programs uh, last, uh, last week, and he had said, you know, one of the challenges that we had was that whenever they went to Memphis or Nashville, they didn't get the answers they needed. And so when they went to the head offices and they just said, you know, it's out of our control because these are independent businesses. And so that, that was what they had thought, but they did not get the answers that they needed through that process. And that's why they reached out to everybody. And so I call it what I call is a colorblind environment. When you go to, when you go to one of these shows where the, the, one of the TPAs has an event, you see every color there. You see black, yellow, green, red, blue. Everybody's there and everybody's present because the insurance companies now get, um, a, get to choose the solution they want in an individual marketplace and not be stuck with the low performers just because they bought a franchise. Interesting. Yeah, I think one, of, one thing I would add to that, uh, Joe, is that with the franchises, probably the biggest challenge that they face, and one of the reasons why it might not be a good fit with a franchise, is because of the cost. If the franchise is already paying north of 10% in franchise fees, and now they're uh, being forced to pay an additional 5 to 10% uh, in the fees for the program, they may be looking at somewhere between 15 and 20% cost, which is, in, in my opinion, uh, unsustainable. And so mm -hmm. that makes it really difficult for the franchises. Back to the other question, too, I did want to mention uh, on, the, on the question of, what did the TPA reps say about the event? I can say that all six of them individually reached out to me and felt that what we had in Nashville was an important first step and they want to continue the dialogue and continue to address the issues that contractors face. So all six of them made that comment. Now whether that's you know uh, a genuine uh, comment and they really want to do that or not remains to be seen and I think we'll take time. All right. Well, let's throw it out for any final comments, gentlemen. We're getting right up against the end here. I know we're not going to solve this issue today, 
But um, any final thoughts from first? Let's start with Mark. So the only final thought I would have or comment I would have is that this, it's most important to me as, as being involved with RIA and, and, uh, and with the Education Committee that this does continue, that this isn't just a one-time event that happened in Nashville and then it, it stops. Uh, that's why we have a, a town hall focused on continuing this dialogue at our annual convention uh, in February. I would certainly encourage anyone that has any association with the restoration industry uh, in Austin, Texas, March 14th to 16th to be there as we continue this dialogue and talk about how we as an association can positively impact and advocate for our contractors. Okay, Phil? Um, uh, two points. The the first one, I had a I had a gentleman call me beforehand and said, you know, I'm going to send I'm going to send two people to this event. I'm going to spend ten thousand dollars to go uh, get out of my office and hotels and travel and everything else. And he said, if it ends here, I wasted my money. And so I'm going to come, but my hope and my expectation is that it doesn't and it goes a little farther. Uh, the second thing is, is um, I'm a big advocate of being responsible for the, your business. So so create your plan. Be deliberate about what you do. Don't go down a road and then just keep on taking work and then realize, oh, my gosh, I, I got in over my head and I didn't realize it. So be responsible and accountable for your own business. Very good. We're going to continue to push this. Pete, any final thoughts from you before we wrap it up? Yeah. Well, considering how, if, 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 if your audience could believe in, in a one-hour call, I've only spoke about 30 seconds so far. <laughs> That's a rare time. I've heard of that should be that should be noted in, in the blog. <laughs> now, I, I have just a couple of comments. I think um, one thing I think that neither Mark nor Phil mentioned, which I think is very significant. Um, we polled our audience. As a matter of fact, Mark did it. I think uh, when he opened before he introduced Phil uh, as the keynote to find out how many people in the audience um, were, were not REA members. It was a significant amount. Uh, at least 30%. And in in the history of the association, for all the years I've been around, and even watching the industry with the connection shows, the experience, all of them, every association and every association kind of underwritten show has never effectively been able to attract people that were not members of the supporting associations. So that that's very important. The second thing, question was, how many of you in the room is this the first time they've ever been to an REA event? And it was almost around the same amount, at least a quarter of the room, the first time they've ever been to the event. So this told us two very important things. The first thing is, if you have timely topics, important topics uh, that people care about, they're going to come, no matter where it is, no matter when it is, and no matter whether they're a member or not. They will come because the topic is important. So I think that was very validating to the committee, to the whole discussion, and why the association basically chose that topic and that storyline is going to continue. The other thing, Joe, that I'd like to comment on that I see coming out of this show, and I think this will be a, a, I think is a good segue for next week's show, is you, when you, the last question you asked that Mark and uh, Phil batted around talking about the different things that these uh, TPAs and insurance companies want, that you mentioned standardized pricing. They don't want standardized pricing. They can't have standardized pricing because that would be a, a, in violation probably of antitrust laws. What they want is they want a standardized scope because we all know that you, you can't do the same job uh, in New York City at the same price that you would do that job uh, you know, in the program, okay? It just won't happen because of all the other cost and ancillary, uh, you know, um, uh, things that would affect that cost. So they want scope. This is the reason why you've seen many of these TPAs in the water area, which represents the, lar the largest percent of the claims that come across the desk of a, a, an adjuster, that they have uh, went to the S-500 and they went to industry standardization. That's the reason why the insurance carriers, the TPAs, the large franchise networks, they want to see the fire standard. They want to see standardization in contents because they have no way to uh, establish what the industry consensus is on the scope. The scope always drives price and will determine what it costs to do something. 
So next week, you're going to have, like, probably in the culmination of this hurricane coverage, you're going to have Ken Larson and Mickey Lee that are going to be talking about their experiences working in Texas and Florida over the last several months of how they've applied the S-500 to all the disaster work that they're seeing out there in the field. And I think this is critically important because what would, if you listen to quite a few of the comments that were brought up that Mark and, and uh, um, Phil mentioned, they came uh, out of the polls, out of the surveys that we took, and what the, member, the RA members were talking about, the challenges was that they get somebody, whether they're a compliance officer or that 22-year-old person, who's reading out of some playbook, and the, the, the discrepancy is not about how much somebody is going to charge for something. It's the interpretation of the scope and the application of the S-500. And I think what's happened now is the insurance industry has advocated that they want standardization, but now if they apply to policies and procedures to do the job properly, now they, they seem to not like the price. Well, you know what? You can't have your cake and eat it, too. you got to pick one or the other. So when you take when you take service, quality, uh, and um, customer service and product selection, you know you pick two out of three. You can't have everything. That's why some people shop at Walmart, and you know other people shop at Home Depot. That's just the way it is. So you know, in my mind, uh, this is an important discussion, which is going to continue. Uh, hopefully, you know, in the weeks and the months to come and that we can find some solutions. You know, the, the key thing, I think, that I sensed in listening to Mark, one of the things that the committee wanted is we were hoping, we, did, we knew we weren't going to get all the answers, but we were hoping we could get some solutions on the table. And um, I'm not so sure that that happened. I think we had some good ideas that were out there, but you know what? You take what you got and just keep trying to move the ball down the field. And I, I think in that regard, I think that um, they did a good job with it. And uh, stay tuned. All right. Stay tuned, Pete. Thank you so much. This was uh, a great idea. You, uh, I got to give it to you. you uh, you're the one that told us we should definitely do the show. We got a lot of great feedback, and we will continue discussing this topic on IAQ Radio. And as Pete mentioned, next Friday we've got Ken Larson and Mickey Lee. We're going to talk a lot about scope and uh follow up a little more on our hurricane coverage and then uh, we'll be back after the holidays and uh, go right back at it with this topic so we look forward to that i want to thank mark springer and phil rosebrook for joining us today of course my co-host the z-man cliff zlotnick pete consigli the restoration industry's global watchdog thank you for joining us most importantly our growing group of loyal listeners and oh at the controls john you gotta have faith great job we'll be back next friday at noon with the next broadcast of iaq radio for IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.